The tactics they have been employing have not been particularly impressive, frankly. They still do not demonstrate the ability to conduct combined arms operations, in other words, tanks supported by infantry, uh, engineers, artillery, mortars, air defense, electronic warfare, and all the rest of that. Um, rather, they're just throwing uh, conscripts, uh, new recruits, uh, at the Ukrainian forces. It's very, very costly. Uh, as you will know, the UK Ministry of Defense uh, estimated the casualty with the losses in the past week were over 850 per day, which is just staggering. A worse month of the surge in lock. We lost 100 fleets, Lee, uh, coalition men and women, and we thought that was horrible. It was. Uh, so the idea of many, many times that just in the same day uh, is just, again, staggering uh, to me to someone who wrote letters of condolence. The Americans, Nellies, and Fadi was uh, almost every night that I was privileged to be the commander during the surge of lock. The idea of losing over 850 soldiers in a single day is just mind-boggling. Yeah, it's horrific. It was staggering. Uh, clearly, the Russians still think that they can out-suffer the Ukrainians, the Europeans, and the Americans. Um, and we need to prove them wrong. Uh, we need to do everything we can to enable the Ukrainians to hold off this particular offensive and then to be able in several months uh, to employ the Western tanks with fighting vehicles additional uh, to conduct their counteroffensive, probably in the May June time frame, uh, to retake the infantry if not all that Russia has taken uh, over the course of the last year and perhaps beyond. A lot to discuss there. You mentioned this figure of uh, perhaps as many as uh, 850 Russian soldiers a day dying. As I understood it, that was a Ukrainian figure. Do you think it really is feasible that the Russians are losing the lives of Russian soldiers at that sort of rate? Certainly possible. In urban combat, uh, the operations are hugely Yankar intensive. Um, you've got to clear every room, every building, every block, uh, and if not done skillfully, not done with sufficient support, precision, uh, fires, a intelligence advantage, reconnaissance assets, labor top, and all the rest of that, which the Russians don't seem capable of doing, and with armored systems is what needed, uh, if not done properly, again, the losses can be staggering. As you note, these are Ukrainian figures that the UK MOD said they couldn't verify, but they nonetheless repeated them, and just that gains that some degree of creep. Frankly, even if it's, quote, just 300 to 500, think of the accumulation uh, over time, and think of the reality that Russia has now lost many times in a single year the soldiers that it lost in nearly 10 years in Afghanistan. And when we hear about the scale of the Russian Build up. Uh, we're seeing U.S. officials warning of a lot of action on the border with Russian bombers, fighter jets and helicopter gunships. And the Ukrainians are already warning that they are running out of ammunition, that they lack the air defences. How should NATO respond? Well, what we've got to do, we, we really need to approach this in terms of uh, near term, mid term, long term. In the near term, uh, we are in dialogue, very close dialogue with our Ukrainian counterparts. I know there are military leaders uh, in Europe and also, frankly, in the Pentagon to identify what it is they need on an urgent basis, whether it's additional 155 millimeter howitzer ammunition, defense uh, assets and, and munitions, uh, more complementary uh, components for a uh, comprehensive integrated air and ballistic missile and counter drone. Uh, defense system, all of this. We've got to get that to them urgently and very likely uh, a lot of spare parts and logistical support from systems that we have already provided. Uh, that's to enable them to withstand this Russian offensive that appears to have begun now and, and is intensified. Uh, over the midterm, this is where we've got to get to them as quickly as possible or enable the training as quickly as possible. And the Western Bank, the industry fighting vehicles, Eland armor, but no advanced systems, uh, the medium range, under 50 kilometer uh, range precision munitions that we're providing for the high mobility and total watch system, et cetera. Uh, that's to enable the Ukrainian offensive that we anticipate in the May June timeframe. 
And then in the long term, we've got to start thinking now, and we are, to be fair. Again, this is a topic of discussion of the ministers that have kind of had on the road of are inevitable. It is, for example, Carol, inevitable that Ukraine has to go to Western fighter bombers. There are no more mate from the guys in the Eastern Bloc systems left, you know, will scour Eastern Europe to help Ukraine maintain what they have to the extent that it is possible. But they're going to have to transition to either F-16, Euro or you name the, pick the platform. And we should help them beginning now to train on those. They have more pilots than aircraft at this point. Uh, and they can easily spare the, the pilots and the maintenance person, which is typically even more complex and more challenging. Although the Ukrainians demonstrate incredible the mechanical that I use yet. Uh, and, and other related decisions and actions like that. So again, near, mid, and long, that's what needs to be done. And frankly, I think that is what is being done. We know that President Zelensky has delivered that impassioned plea for Western aircraft. At the moment, President Biden has said he's not prepared to send fighter jets. Uh, The UK has said nothing is off the table. But are you saying that the West should get a move on and should send President Zelensky those fighter jets that he's asking for. What I'm saying is that we should start down that road. We should recognize the inevitability. Again, this has to happen. There is no alternative. There aren't any more MiG-29s in the market that we can provide to Ukraine. Uh, Make that decision to help them down that road. Start by training, again, pilots and mechanics in particular. Uh, And over time, they can decide, again, the numbers, the which platform, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that more decisions like that need to be made, remembering that the answer traditionally has been no on a whole host of different systems over the course of the last year until it is yes. I mean, the most recent, of course, is Emerald Abrams tanks, for which there are reasonable reservations. It's not the perfect platform for the Ukrainians digging the challenges of a 1,500 horsepower uh, jet engine surrounded by 70 tons of armor. But if that was the price of getting the Germans to agree to provide Leopard 2s from their stocks and also to allow other countries with them to provide them, then that was uh, was appropriate and it was made. And it, there's been a host of these others, the longer range uh, munitions, precision munitions taking out to 150 kilometers and after the high mobility artillery rocket system and, and many others along those lines. But the tanks have not even arrived and Ukraine is clearly worried that there is a risk that its forces on the front line could be overwhelmed. Well, in the defensive, uh, I think that they have demonstrated enormous skill. Uh, They do have tanks. Again, let's remember, they actually, by some counts, depending on the condition of those that they have captured, uh, they may have more tanks than they had when they started. Uh, what they need now is to get these Western tanks into their hands as quickly as is possible. And they're already training on them. Various countries are helping to facilitate the training. Uh, and it's well known that that's going on, uh, for example, even at the uh, U.S. training bases in Germany at Frohenfels and Grafen here. And we will enable them, I believe, to do what the Russians have not done, which is to achieve combined arms effects. In other words, tanks, infantry, artillery, mortars, engineers, air defense, electronic warfare, all together uh, in a way that the Russians have not been able to do, and then to conduct the maneuver operations, not just straightforward bang into the enemy and then hammer them with artillery until uh, everything around them has been destroyed and they have to withdraw. We know that the supply of military equipment is putting a huge strain on the forces of the UK, the US and other NATO allies Particular concerns have even been raised, apparently, by some NATO allies that the UK forces have been hollowed out to such a degree that it is undermining their capabilities. The Defence Secretary himself has warned that uh, he wants a great deal more money to uh, bolster the defence budget. Are you concerned about the state of the UK military? Well, I think the Minister of Defence has raised a very important point. And I think we all should be concerned, uh, given especially that the partnership between the U.S. and the U.K. military is a component of the special relationship. Uh, having been privileged to command, uh, you know, I have five combat commands over the course of my general officer time alone. Uh, the military that was always the most important beyond the U.S. was that of the U.K. Uh, so it is very significant 
uh, that the capabilities have been uh, reduced, as the minister has forthrightly noted. Uh, and I think it's something that the government obviously has to uh, recognize and address. Let me just ask you about the shooting down of a spy balloon over uh, the waters at, by the, the United States and then three other objects that have yet to be identified. Do you think that the Biden administration was right to shoot down these objects before it even knows what they are? Uh, yes. Uh, and again, here you have to take into account not just sort of the strategic realities, the military realities, the intelligence realities, but there are some political realities. Uh, that's what happens in, in Washington. And uh, those realities really require to, uh, at the end that that be done. Uh, now, I think there was very clear understanding of the first object uh, reportedly into the reports that are coming out now. Uh, it was tracked all the way from its launcher pad in Hainan, uh, and and then, of course, briefly over Alaska, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think the original spy balloon and the other objects were all part of a Chinese surveillance operation? Well, I don't know about the other ones, frankly, and uh, I'm not sure that we have been able to examine them sufficiently. But the first one, again, uh, it was tracked all the way, reportedly, from its launch pad in uh, Hainan and uh, followed along the way and, again, examined very carefully a lot of the various aspects of the system that were on it very clearly pointed to a reality that this is for signals and imagery and other forms of intelligence. So again, I think this was the right decision. And also the way they did, I thought, was quite skillful. You know, populated areas, given the size of this, as you know, it was, you know, the size of three school buses or something like that, it's a very considerable and it would have a lot of momentum uh, when it fell from 60,000 feet or so. Uh, and yet over shallow water so that it has been recovered fairly easily. Were you ever aware of anything like this when you were at the CIA? No, not that I recall. I've been racking my brain to recall. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't use of various balloons. You know, we use balloons that tethered balloons uh, very widely in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm keenly aware of other commercial balloons. Uh, Google actually had a an initiative called Noon, which floated balloons over Africa, as I recall, with the prevailing winds to provide internet service uh, to populations that didn't have it otherwise. Uh, and I think we're discovering that there are vastly more balloons in the sky uh, than we ever realized. Uh, the nether services here in the United States launch hundreds of them, I'm told, uh, as, as do many others. Um, so I think if nothing else, we're going to get a much better audit of what a floating sort of guy. But of course, the first balloon was so massive, uh, so large, I mean, very easily visible to the naked eye. Uh, and frankly, therefore, so blatant. Uh, and it really calls into question all the process uh, and decision making uh, in China uh, for carrying out what clearly is a very sensitive, exceedingly provocative and blatant activity. Uh, and it really raises the question, what is the approval process or what was the approval process? Uh, if the approval process we just terminated at sort of a mid-level, it calls into question uh, the decision-making process for a very, uh, again, sensitive, provocative, blatant uh, action. If the approval process went all the way to the top and got thumbs up, that calls into question, uh, if you will, judgment uh, about something so blatant and provocative. And should we all in the West, the US and the UK, be reassessing the scale of the threat of Chinese surveillance when it comes to a whole range of the technology that we use? Yes, but I think we're quite aware of a variety of different forms of surveillance. This is just a subset or one component of that on which we have not focused sufficiently in the past. So we are literally opening up the aperture, as they say, and, and this is, again, quite literal. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of detection means. They just weren't sufficiently sensitive to some of uh, the various components on this surveillance activity. 
Um, this is not unlike intrusion devices, but around critical infrastructure or uh, property. Uh, and you know, you have to send it just right so that every squirrel and chipmunk does it set it off. But you do want the most substantial uh, possible uh, violators to be identified. And so there's a lot of tweaking going on uh, of the detection and identification systems that we have, uh, certainly over North America in particular.